Support for this podcast and the following message come from Money Mind from Prudential, a podcast powered by your financial behavior. Hear insights from financial psychologists, experts, and more. Download and subscribe to Money Mind wherever you find podcasts and learn more at slate.com slash money mind. Are you looking for the best stocking stuffer ever? How about an Ask Me Another ticket pack? Ten tickets good for any Bell House show through the end of 2017. Bring nine friends or just come alone ten times. It's up to you. It's the perfect gift for the nerdy pop culture fan in your life, which just might be you. More information at amatickets.org. You can take Ask Me Another and more with you with the NPR One app. NPR One finds the best from public radio and beyond. Surprising interviews, local stories, and your favorite podcasts. NPR One is ready to make driving, holiday shopping, or cleaning the house better. Find NPR O-N-E on your app store. From NPR and WNYC, coming to you from a studio in a skyscraper in midtown Manhattan, it's NPR's hour of puzzles, word games, and trivia, Ask Me Another. I'm Jonathan Colton. Now here's your host, Ophira Eisenberg. Thank you, Jonathan. Today we're taking a break from our usual home at the Bell House, and we are broadcasting out of NPR's beautiful studios in New York City. Why? Well, because we have listeners all over the country who want to play our games, but they can't or won't travel to New York. Today, we're opening up our phone lines to them across the United States. And even though we are not taping in a bar this week, I have graciously volunteered to be our house mixologist. Excellent. So I have some puzzle guru Art Chung. If you want want me to make you a drink, I'm happy to make you something. What Uh, would you like? I'll have a vodka martini with a little lemon twist. Okay. I can I can do that. Ophira, is there something you would like? Uh, yeah, I'll have a bourbon bitters and a shot of Robitussin. Oh, yeah, the Ophira special? Yeah, lucky sure. cocktail. I, here's the thing. This is just a fake uh, prop cocktail shaker, so I don't actually have any, any ingredients to make. Don't worry about it. I have my own shaker. By the way, later in the show, we'll be joined by our special guest, Pablo Hidalgo. Pablo is a creative executive at Lucasfilm, where he keeps track of all things Star Wars. But first, it's time for a game we call... Stump Jonathan Colton. This is where we ask our in-house mixologist and all-around smarty pants Jonathan Colton about a piece of trivia we found on the internet. Here is your question, Jonathan. Okay. It was the year 1004. Okay. What relatively new handheld object was derided by clergy as being sinfully decadent? <laughs> It now sounds like it's a commercial for whatever I'm talking I, about, no. but back then it was bad, denounced. Uh, was it a, a brownie? No. <laughs> sounds like you're describing a dessert. Right, exactly. A handheld object. Handheld object. This is in, in 1004. 1004. It probably wasn't any sort of um, tool that had a, an important purpose because that's, there's nothing decadent about holding something that you actually need. So it wasn't, say, a hammer. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> you decadent hammer. Uh, so perhaps some sort of a, a leisure time device? Part of the clue is that it was relatively new in 1004. So people were doing fine without it. Yeah, you could deal without it. But would you want to? Well, <laughs> depending on the culture. A spatula, no. Well, you know uh, is a kitchen, a, a kitchen implement of some kind uh, sure. for food preparation? Uh, close. Or, is it, Afira, is it a fork? Yes. So the niece of the Byzantine emperor used a golden fork. Of course, it was golden, right? Sure, well. Uh, at her wedding feast in Venice. Said one clergy member, God in his wisdom has provided man with natural forks, his fingers. Gross. Disgusting. So back then it was common to eat with one's hands and using a knife only if you needed to cut something. The idea of using a fork was an affront to the Almighty. But get this, that bride died of the plague a few years later. Sure. So they were like, ha-ha, you know why that happened? Because you used a fork. (laughs) Joke's on her. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. And I'm sure it was all about that fork. Yeah, probably. Mm -hmm. So if you heard a piece of trivia that you think will stump Jonathan Colton, share it with us on Facebook or Twitter. It's time to welcome our first two contestant callers to the show. First up, David Pickett. You're a software engineer calling from Salem, New Hampshire. Welcome. Hello, Gorpier. Good to be here. 
Your opponent is Mary Bucklin, and you work for a catering company, and you're calling from Austin, Texas. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, everyone. David and Mary, the first of you who wins two of our games will move on to our final round at the end of the show. So let's go to your first game. We're going to start with a word game called Tilt the Title. In this game, you're going to take famous books and rearrange the words in their titles to make new weird books. Jonathan Colton has an example. I do. If I said, in this book by John Steinbeck, fruits that are tired of being stomped on finally take their revenge, you would answer, the wrath of grapes, rearranging (laughs) the words in the grapes of wrath. Each clue will hint at the original work and the rearranged title, and contestants, even though you're playing on the phone, our underpaid NPR scientists have actually worked out a remote game show buzzer system, so you're going to buzz in to answer. And the winner will be one step closer to the final round at the end of the show. Here we go. In this book by Stieg Larsson, a man tracking down a killer receives help from Smaug, who has a tramp stamp of a young woman on his back. David? Uh, this would be the dragon with a girl tattoo? Look at that. That's correct. In this Truman Capote novella, that 80s pop singer with the hit I Think We're Alone Now is never alone for her morning meal, thanks to her neighbor Holly. Mary. Tiffany's at breakfast? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Breakfast at Tiffany's, that's right. But they're at uh, a mall, so it's Panda Express. Yum, yum, yum. I, you know, I really love Panda Express for breakfast. <laughs> What do you get for breakfast? Oh, yeah, what do you get? Well, whatever they got. But sometimes you get to the airport a little early. It's breakfast time. Yeah. The only thing open is uh, the Panda Express. I'm delighted when that happens. <laughs> you know what? I think being the first person of the day to eat Panda Express, you're getting the best Panda the Express. The best, the freshest, hottest Panda <laughs> the, Express all yep. day. This nonfiction book by Irma S. Rombauer is a collection of recipes for cannibals who wish to dine on Ms. Behar from The View. Mary. The Cooking of Joy. Yeah, that's right. Little uh, cannibal recipe series (laughs) that we enjoy. We should say NPR does not endorse cannibalism. In this classic by Judy Bloom, the man upstairs wants to answer a preteen girl's call, but she never picks up. Mary. Are you there, Margaret? It's me, God. (laughs) Yeah, you got it. That's right. This non-linear novel by William Burroughs features a wandering junkie who prefers to eat his midday meal without any clothes on. David. Lunch naked. Yeah, who wouldn't? <laughs> <laughs> al fresco. Dining al fresco, we call that. Dining al fresco. That's right. <laughs> no. Don't get the suit unless you, you have a... Uh, you can, but it's risky. A heat-resistant napkin. Mm-hmm. In this book by Pat Conroy, a therapist helps a man remember that the flow of the ocean is harshly affected by purple rain. David. Uh, The Tides of Prince. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Yeah. All right, this is your last clue. In this book by Michael Ondaatje, we learn that no one is better at waiting than people who live in Britain. Uh, Oh, wow. Uh, This is a hard one. Mary. The Patient English? The Patient uh, English is correct. Yeah. Yes. They are very patient. They know how to cue. All right. Puzzle Guru Archung, how did our contestants do? They did great in a tough game, but congratulations, Mary. You're one step closer to moving on to the final round. All right, next we're going to play a version of our favorite game, This, That, or the Other. This one is celebrating national parks and Japanese monsters. But first, let's check in with our contestants, David Pickett. Now, you got into the Boston Symphony Orchestra Choir on a double dog dare? Uh, Yeah, definitely. I had a a coworker that became uh, aware of a cow call that the BSO was holding. And uh, he was saying, it's like, you know, we should go do this. And uh, I said, okay, fine, let's do it. And I wound up getting a call back, and I wound up uh, getting in. and wound up singing with him for eight seasons. How about your pal? Yeah, um, it's still kind of a sore point. Uh, whenever, <laughs> oh, jeez. Whenever we get together, uh, he makes the point of pointing out that I got in and he did not. You know, it's, it's just he can't let it go. It's hard to have success, David. Believe me, I understand how difficult it is. Well, you know, it's lonely at the top. Remember that. That's right. Mary Buckland, you interned at America's Test Kitchen. So what's one of the best tests you witnessed? Mm, that was another job where you got to eat everything at the end. So yeah. I remember we they were testing a beef tenderloin recipe, and that was the best day. 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> you were like, I need one more little bit of the <laughs> one. You're like, I, this one isn't quite right. I think we got to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's time for this, that, or the other. Contestants, I'm going to give you a word, and you have to tell me which of three categories it belongs to. And today's categories are dog breeds, national parks, or Japanese kaiju monsters. Those are, of course, the ones who destroy cities. So we're going to alternate back and forth. No need to buzz in. Mary, you won the last game, so if you win this, you'll go straight to the final round. And David, you need to win this, or we're going to hang up on you. Okay. Oh. Okay. <laughs> That's very sad. <laughs> Click. David, we'll start with you. Akita. Akita is a dog. Yes, it is. It's a uh, a dog that was bred for large game hunting. All right, Mary. El Moro. Uh, national Park? That is a national park. Yay. Yeah. There's a monster in that park named Moro. No, I'm just no. <laughs> they named the park after the monster. <laughs> yeah, exactly. this happens a lot. David Jidora. Uh, that's a Japanese monster. That is a Japanese monster. Do you know this monster? Uh, no, but it sure sounds like one. Yeah, it's a three headed serpent or dragon. They love going on walks. Mary Borzoi. Dog breed. It is a dog breed. It looks like a greyhound, but with Montley crew hair. For for lovers of Montley Crew, it was very popular in the eighties. It's a little dated. It's this little dog dated. looks a little dated. David Basenji. A uh, Basenji is a dog. It is, and you know what's famous about a Basenji? Yeah, it doesn't bark. I think it doesn't bark. Do they make another sound instead of barking, or they just don't? They make this weird whimper. My neighbor used to have one. They just kind of make that kind of odd whimpering sound that sometimes dogs make. They were bred to drive monkeys and small cats up trees. Sure. <laughs> with their weird bark. With their weird, yeah, exactly. Just <laughs> with their eyes. <laughs> Mary, hey, Dora. Uh, Japanese monster? You are correct. Yeah, it's a smog monster. It's named for the Japanese word for sludge, slime, vomit, chemical oh. ooze. They just have one word for yeah. all those things? They think we're crazy. Those Americans have so many words for hey, Dora. <laughs> <laughs> All right, these are your last clues. David, Cuyahoga. Cuyahoga National Park. Yeah, have you been there? Uh, no, but I'm familiar with it. Mary, here's your last one. Annie Akchak. National Park? Yes, it's a national park. It's in Alaska. It's the least visited national park, which... You know, does it exist if no one goes? I don't know. But you were correct. That's all that matters. Let's go to our puzzle guru, Archung. How did our contestants do? They got them all right, so we're going to a quick tiebreaker. Hands on your buzzers. Your clue is Gojira. Mary. Japanese monster. That is correct. Well done. That was how you say Godzilla in Japan. Congratulations, Mary. You've won both games, and you're headed Yay. to the final round. So coming up, we'll find out who will face off against Mary in our final round at the end of the show. And Jonathan Colton will perform a word game hidden inside of a music parody that will make you sing, Can You Eel the Love Tonight? I'm Ophira Eisberg, and you're listening to Ask Me Another from NPR. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your earbuds. Our sponsor, History Vault, wants you to know about the perfect gift for the history buffs this holiday season. You can stream hundreds of hours of videos exploring ancient Rome, presidential elections, military history, and everything in between. History Vault is the only place where you can watch History Channel content anytime you want, anywhere you are. There are no commercials and new videos are added every week. So visit historyvault.com slash askmeanother to give the gift of the History Channel today. The following message comes from smartphone maker OnePlus with their new OnePlus 3T, a higher standard of what you should come to expect from your smartphone. The 3T powers through emails, games, and more with its 2.3 gigahertz Qualcomm processor. Store all of your music, pictures, and files with up to 120 gigabytes of memory and get a full day's charge in as little as 30 minutes with exclusive dash charge technology. What's best, the OnePlus 3T won't lock you in with restrictive carrier 
contracts. So get your hands on your own OnePlus 3T today at OnePlus.net. This is Ask Me Another, NPR's hour of puzzles, word games, and trivia. I'm Jonathan Colton, here with puzzle guru Art Chung. Now here's your host, Ophira Eisenberg. Thank you, Jonathan. This week we're broadcasting a special episode from NPR Studios in New York, where we're opening up our phone lines to contestants all across the United States. Before the break, our contestant Mary won her way to the final round at the end of the show, and we're going to find out a little later who she will face off against. But first, it's time for a game we call Mystery Guest. A stranger is on the phone. Jonathan and I have no idea who this person is or what makes them special. Only our puzzle guru, our Chung, does. That's right. You and Jonathan will have to ask yes or no questions to figure out our mystery guest secret. Our mystery guest today is calling from England. Mystery guest, please That's introduce yourself. Hello, my name's Leslie Scott, and I created Something You Do With Friends. Something You Do With Friends. That's something right. You Do With Friends. You okay. have to figure out what she created, and Ophira, you get the first question. Okay, Leslie, is it a game? Yes. Ha ha ha! I'm oh. close. <laughs> All right, so far so good. So, is this a board game? No. No. Is it a card game? No. <laughs> Uh-oh. Mm. Mm. I'm out. <laughs> oh, wait a second. There's... <laughs> Is it a... Uh, what are the kinds of... There's board games. There's card games. Uh, does it involve darts? No. Mm. Yeah, she invented the age-old <laughs> game of darts. <laughs> well, there could darts. be a variation I'm not familiar with. She invented darts and the pub. <laughs> oh, wait a second. Is it beer pong? <laughs> No. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, is it a, is it a game that uh, traditionally one sits down at a table to play? Yes, but you don't have to. Yes, but you don't have very to. Very cagey, Leslie. I'm going to interject and yes. say that the table is very useful. Yes. Okay. This game that you've invented involves uh, some sort of pieces or props that enable you to play the game. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, okay. So right. So I need to purchase some stuff in order to play this game. I can't just play it right now here with my friends. No. Yeah. Right? That's how you make the money, right, Leslie? Like, absolutely. Yes. She really has us over a barrel with this game that you have to purchase a thing in order to play it. Okay, wait a second. Wait a second. I'm forgetting what era we live in. Leslie, do these people have to be in the same room? To play it? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Oh, so I was thinking well, it's over at the computer or the uh, handheld well, device. That's a good question, though. It's, is, it, it's not a, is it a computer-based game at all? No. No. Okay. So you're with a bunch of people. You have no cards, no dice, no board. What is it? Are there letters and or words oh. involved? Is it a word game? No. Do you need to read in order to play this game? Um, no, you don't. Wow. I'm going to ask a question, Leslie. Is it one of the most popular games in the world? It is. And do you think that Ophira and Jonathan have played it? I think they will have played it. Oh, is it something that is played more by children? Um, it's played by children and adults. Does it involve physical manipulation? Of those yes. pieces. Okay. Oh. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Is it Jenga? Yes. <gasps> hey! oh! There you go. Yes. <laughs> That's a great game. That is a great game, and I have, in fact, played it. You're right. Wow, you invented I... Jenga. That's crazy. It seems like that game has just existed uh, forever. forever. Yeah, like how the lo- moon. How long has that game existed? Well, I, I put it on the market in 1983. Now, what uh, inspired this idea to create this game? I was born and uh, raised in Africa, uh-huh. and I have a, a much younger brother. He was about five at the time, and I was 18. And he had a set of wooden building blocks, you know, just children's wooden building blocks. The only thing that made them slightly different from any that you'd normally see around is that they were all more or less the same size, almost the same size dimensions as, as a now Jenga is. Okay, so they were very um, uniform. Yeah, they were uniform, and they were sort of shaped from offcuts from a sawmill in Ghana. Mm-hmm. So they were sort of slightly handmade things. And, and, and we were just playing around with this that came up with the basic idea for the game. And then a few years later, I just sort of played it with various friends who all <laughs> went, you know, they, they loved this game. <laughs> and then I decided to put on the market. I mean, there was a lot of more involved in doing it but at that stage i had to sort of figure out how to mass produce something that had been handmade before sure but i still had to have 
built into this, the idea of the slight variances that you have because it was handmade originally. Right, because, of course, you have to have a loose... That's the thing when you're playing Jenga is you sort of poke around until you find a loose piece. Exactly. And that only happens if the pieces are not entirely uniform. Yeah, absolutely. So they're all randomly different and only very, very slightly different huh. in one set. Wow. They're all sort of slightly different. And then I gave it the name Jenga, which is actually Swahili, which is a language I spoke growing up in East Africa. And it means build. It's, it's the imperative. You know, get on and build. <laughs> get on. Build. And is it true the toy companies didn't want it to be named Jenga? They wanted to give it some other uh, more generic name? Yeah, they hated the name Jenga. Sure, because <laughs> they, they I, mean, when I, I mean, I published it myself to begin with. Um, and then, first of all, the Canadian company, Irwin Toy, wanted to take it on, and then Hasbro after that. I mean, it was almost a deal-breaker. They said they wanted it to be called something other than Jenga, because... Here was a game that nobody knew anything about the game, and right. when it just kind of sits there as a block of wood, it doesn't look like anything. <laughs> it doesn't look, it doesn't like, look like much fun, I suppose. <laughs> and then it's got a weird name. Yeah. I don't know how are you going to sell this? <laughs> I'm glad that you stuck with it, because it's actually, well, now it's a very iconic name, and everyone knows exactly what that is. Now, Leslie, Jenga was the first game you, you created, but it wasn't the last, and you're a professional game designer. Yes, I am. I am. And, I, and in fact, I've actually I've designed and published something in the order of about 40 games. Wow. Um, I mean, they're not all on the market still, <laughs> but some of them are. And my, I have a, a company called Oxford Games, and that now is actually run by my daughter. I mean, our, our most popular one at the moment is a game called Ex Libris which is a book game. I mean, most of the other games I've designed are not the same sort of mass market appeal as Jenga. The way you went, those questions, you said, you know, <laughs> do you have to read? Do you have to do it? You, you, you really don't. You need no skills. There's only about two, two rules. You need no skills, yeah. no prior skills to play Jenga. Yeah, but so you know it's sort of a perfect game the, for that reason. Yeah, it's certainly one of the reasons why it's so successful and, so, and played you know, all over the world. Thank you so much for creating that game, and thanks for being an amazing mystery guest. Well, it's fun. It's, it's fun to talk to you. Thank you so much, Leslie Scott, creator of Jenga and many other games. Thanks for being our mystery guest on Ask Me Another. Our next two contestants will play an especially challenging music parody game. First up, Kirsten Lenthe. You're calling from Boston, where you're a resident director at Boston College. Welcome. Thank you. Your opponent is Owen Moorhead, and you're a park ranger calling from Hyde Park, Texas. Welcome. Oh, thanks for having me. So who is uh, watching the park right now? Uh, I don't think anybody's watching the park. What? <laughs> okay, remember, Kirsten and Owen, the first of you who wins two of our games is going to move on to our final round at the end of the show. Let's get to your first game. Kirsten, what song did you slow dance to in middle school? Oh, that would be the classic Tiny Dancer. Couldn't go wrong there. <laughs> Middle school and high school. Got them both. Wait, wait a second. I know that it's a classic song, but that was a slow dance song? Yeah. Wow. It was a great one. Yeah. Tiny Dancer. It literally says, hold me closer, Tiny Dancer. So it's got instructions in it right in there. I know. You can't go wrong. Yeah. And would you think in your mind as whoever you were dancing with held you closer, would you go, I'm the Tiny Dancer? <laughs> <laughs> That was what I was aiming for. <laughs> that was always. It. Very good. Owen, what song did you slow dance to in middle school? I have to be honest with you. I didn't go to any dances in middle school or high school. I was too shy to invite anybody myself, and nobody invited me. So I just ended up doing other things. If you were to slow dance tomorrow, do you have a song in mind? Uh, it'd have to be The Dance by Garth Brooks. <laughs> I didn't see that one coming. Uh, the classic one in my school was Stairway to Heaven. That was a classic. Yeah, that's fine until you get to the fast section, and then nobody knows what to do. Well, you you sit, you go apart for a little while, and you just, like, dance really furiously. And, and, then, you come, and then you come back together. All right, that's nice. That's a nice metaphor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. For the, for the rockiness of a relationship. That's right. That's how it is in real life. Your first game is a music parody game, and it's also a word game called Olids. That's the word ballads with one letter missing. Jonathan Colton, take it away. So in this game, I'm going to play a ballad for you, but we have changed the lyrics to reflect what would happen if we removed one letter from the song's title. So, for example, if I sang the Cyndi Lauper song Time After Time, but the lyrics were about Project Runway after Tim Gunn retires, you would answer Time After Tim, dropping one letter from the song Time After Time. Puzzle Guru Art Chung is standing by if you need any hints. 
Just buzz in to identify the song title with one letter removed, and the winner will be one step closer to moving on to the final round at the end of the show. Are you ready? I'm ready. Ready as I'm ever going to be. Okay, here we go. Did you ever know that you're my hairpiece? The curly brown locks that my wife did. I don't look bolder than an eagle. You are Owen. It's got to be the wind beneath my wig. That's right. We'll take that. The wind beneath my wigs. Nobody wants that. <laughs> no, no, it's bad. You don't. <laughs> if the wind is getting under your wig, something yeah. terrible is about to happen. Greetings from the other side. We've got sinners who have died Too late to be sorry For everything that they've done They're condemned to suffer Eternal damnation Kirsten Hell Hell is correct (laughs) One of our darker clues it is in a, the old lighthearted Ask Me Another. Definitely some darkness to it, I agree. <laughs> of course, that was from Hello from Adele. I think this was her first run at Hello. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, you know what? It's too dark. I'm going to lighten yeah, it up weird. a little bit. All right, here we go. Warm, hot, is my thermostat. I believe that. Owen. My heat will go on. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Okay, here's another one. You and me, we used to rise together, everywhere together, climbing. I really feel I'm reaching the graph bend. I can't believe this could be. A trend It looks as though You're on a cliff And at the top I don't want you to stop Owen Don't peek That's right, don't peek uh, from Don't Speak by No Doubt Alright, this is your last clue Yes, it's true, I'm not good at talking loud But I still need to speak cause there's a crowd These folks never seem to hear word one You can help if you please speak in unison Won't you? Kirsten Stay with me. Stay with me. You got it. Stay with me, of course. Yeah, I love that Tom Petty song. <laughs> Zing. Art Chung, how did our contestants do? They both did great at a very tough game, but congratulations to Owen. You're one step closer to the final round. Next, our contestants will have to deal with the world's worst GPS, but first, let's check in with them. Kirsten Lenthe, you are trying to visit all 50 states. So where in the process are you? I'm, I believe at last count, 34. 34, okay. Do you have an order in mind? Well, I'm going to Hawaii for Thanksgiving, so that's going to be my next one. Oh, I'm nice. Planning on, I mean, I'd like to end with Alaska, but I think there are going to be a couple of states that are kind of hard to squeeze in there in the meantime. Now, are you going to Hawaii for Thanksgiving just because that is something you would do? Or, you know, when you're planning... I don't know, a trip, are you specifically looking at uh, getting in a new state based on your goal? So Hawaii will be my mom's last state, so we're going for her to celebrate being done 50 states for her, and she's bringing the whole family along. That's so, all right, so it's genetic. Yeah. Interesting, very good. Now, Owen Moorhead, as a park ranger, have you ever saved an animal? Uh, Yeah, yeah. I've actually saved a few animals. That's probably the most rewarding part of my job. Yeah. I prefer animals to people. Yeah, okay. (laughs) (laughs) 
Do you have a, uh, is there a memorable animal saving moment in your life that you can share with us? You know, they're all memorable in their own way. The most satisfying was when I rescued a baby possum that had fallen off of a cliff. Its left eye was like hanging out of its head oh. and it was just curled up on the ground. I was so <laughs> worried. I was bawling all the way to the wildlife rescue place, but they got it and they took care of it. I think they still have the shirt that I used to wrap it in, actually. Oh. That is a very memorable story. Kirsten and Owen, we've got a trivia game for you called Misdirection. Here we are going to imagine what would happen if a computer virus attacked your GPS and made it even dumber. All you have to do is figure out what national landmark the GPS is trying to help you get to. Owen, you won the last game, so win this and you're going right to the final round. Kirsten, you need to win this or you'll be forced to find your way through the world with nothing but a divining rod. Here we go. Walk away from the Arch de Triumph. Down the Champ Elysees. Enter the Glass Pyramid. You have arrived at your destination. Kirsten. The Louvre? Yes, indeed, the Louvre. Have you been? Never been to France. Never been to France. You've been all over the States. The next thing you have to do is go to all the countries, right? Is that your plan? Easy to ask. Okay, no problem. All right, here's your next clue. Walk along the river Thymes until you see the clock from National Lampoon's European Vacation. Your destination is the church from the Da Vinci Code. Owen. Westminster Abbey. Yes, indeed. I like the pop culture uh, GPS. Yeah, this GPS has a lot of uh, <laughs> attitude and uh, it's got its own idea about things. I like it. It's watch National Lampoon's European Vacation. Yeah, Not every true. GPS can say that. <laughs> Here's your next clue. Drive south over the Harbor Bridge. Your destination is on the left. It's the building that looks like a bunch of white sails. It's the only Australian building you recognize. Owen. Sydney Opera House. Yes, that is correct. Proceed up the Acropolis, past the Greek ruins. Stop at the rectangular temple with dozens of columns. Kirsten. The uh, Parthenon? Oh, yeah, we'll give it to you as oh, Parthenon. This is your last clue. From the legislative building in Queen's Park, proceed south toward Lake Ontario. Turn right next to Blue Jay Stadium. Your destination is a tall, thin spire with a bulge on it. Owen. Is it the CN Tower? That is the CN Tower. Have you been there? Uh, No, I actually have never been anywhere in Canada. Canada has a lot of parks, Owen. I've heard. I've heard. They look really cool. <laughs> Wait, I have, a, I have a question for the Canadian. Yeah. What does CN stand for? Canadian National, based on the railroad. Puzzle Guru Archung, how did our contestants do? They both did great in this game. Congratulations to Owen. You've won both games, and you're moving on to the final round. It's settled. Our finalists are Mary and Owen, and they're going to face off in the final round at the end of the show. And if your TPS, that's Trivia Positioning System, always directs you to the right answers, let it steer you over to amatickets.org to become a contestant. Coming up, the force is with us in the form of Pablo Hidalgo, Lucasfilm's keeper of all Star Wars knowledge. Do stick around, or do not. There is no try. I'm Ophira Eisenberg, and you're listening to Ask Me Another from NPR. Support for this podcast and the following message comes from Mrs. Fields, who wants to help you delight your friends, family, and clients this holiday season. At MrsFields.com, it's easy to send handcrafted treats to anyone, anywhere. Choose from classic chocolate chip, hand-frosted buttercream cookies, or rich and flavorful bundt cakes, all baked fresh and packaged with holiday cheer. To order, visit MrsFields.com and use code NPR to save 20% at checkout. And it also lets Mrs. Fields know that you appreciate NPR too. If you've been enjoying this podcast and want to keep it going, well, the best way to do that is throw a little support to your local public radio station. That support allows us to keep doing our thing. So go to npr.org slash stations to find your local station, donate a few bucks, and tell them we sent you. And thank you so much to those who have done this already. Again, that's npr.org slash stations.
This is NPR's Ask Me Another. I'm Jonathan Colton, here with puzzle guru Art Chung. Now here's your host, Ophira Eisenberg. Thanks, Jonathan. Today we're broadcasting from NPR's studios in New York, and we're opening the phone lines to contestants from across the country. Two contestants have won their way to the final round, and soon we'll find out whether Mary or Owen will be our big winner. But first, it's time to welcome our special guest. When people at Lucasfilm have a question about the Star Wars universe, they turn to one man, Pablo Hidalgo. He's basically Lucasfilm's own personal Yoda. Pablo joins me in studio. Welcome to Ask Me Another. Hey, thanks for having me. So, you know, we have something in common right off the top. What's that? We're both Canadian. That's right. You grew up in Winnipeg, Winnipeg, Manitoba. Manitoba, yep. Even by Canadian standards... We call it winter peg. Oh, yeah. Because it is actually cold. Very much so. There was a story a few years ago about uh, the fact that it was colder in Winnipeg than it was on Mars <laughs> one, one night or something. I don't know if that was true, but it's like, yeah, that sounds about right. Is it as cold as Hoth? Yes. <laughs> colder, <laughs> actually. Now, you've said that the coldness of Winnipeg actually influenced your childhood in a positive way that has led you to the career you have. Oh, I would think so. As I said, Winnipeg is this great incubator for indoor hobbies. Right. Because uh, you're trapped indoors, you know. You have to do something with yourself for Hours. upwards of six months. <laughs> right, as the sky is gray. Yeah, so I, I contend that you're going to find the best model railroad builders, the best, <laughs> you know, hobbyist of any sort that, that keeps you inside uh, in Winnipeg. There was a lot of, like, traditional animation that came out of Winnipeg, and I, I'm certain that's because uh, you don't want to go outside. So you might as well draw hundreds of thousands of drawings in, se in sequence and, and make a film out of it, you know? And from an early age, what were you drawn to? I was drawn to Star Wars. I mean, yeah. I was drawn to fantasy in general, but uh, Star Wars was just this great place to visit, ultimately. Did you have a character that you related to? Uh, I don't know about relation. I don't know what it says about me that my favorite character is and will always be R2-D2. You're the comic. Uh, it's like the uh, sidekick comic, sort of sarcastic. He's small, he's helpful. I don't know. I, I share Very those attributes. Sweet. You know what? You could argue that R2-D2 has a bit of a Canadian mentality. I think mentality. he does. I think he does. He's, he's helpful. I mean, and uh, he may gripe, but ultimately he'll he'll come through in the end. So at Lucasfilm, your title is Creative Executive, which I have to say sounds a little made up. Well, yeah. What is actually your day-to-day -day job. My job, essentially, is to know Star Wars backwards and forwards so that I could answer and field any Star Wars questions that come my way. We work as a group. We're this part of this Lucasfilm called the Story Group. And we basically work with creatives of all types who are interested in telling stories in Star Wars. And we help them find the stories that they're trying to tell and make sure it fits into the overall Star Wars universe. And they'll have all sorts of questions because it can be very intimidating to enter the, this the universe. Where to start? Where do we begin? And uh, I'll help guide these people through that place and answer whatever questions they have. And then review whatever it is that they're creating to make sure that this all fits going forward. So are you constantly, people are coming up to you, peppering you with questions, and you have to say, no, that does not happen in the Star Wars universe? <laughs> not constantly, but a lot of times I'm just given sort of this, this gut check of something, like, you know, what do you think of this, what do you think of that? A lot of times there are authors or artists or what have you that are really interested in pulling back some veils of mystery, and there are some things that we want to keep cryptic or open to interpretation. You know, we kind of shy against people trying to put too much definition on the Force, sure. on Yoda, <laughs> sure. on things that should remain <laughs> mystical, because you don't want to know, you know, where Yoda does his grocery shopping or... <laughs> Right, or, it takes all the magic away. Exactly. To, to me, it's like he's better to be this mystical sage than someone who has to, you know, deal with all the physicality and, and dull stuff that comes out of being 900 years old. So let's talk about the latest Star Wars film, Rogue One. Now, this takes place before Episode Four, A New Hope. Uh, it's about the rebels stealing the plans for the Death Star. That's right. Uh, so this is kind of a interesting thing because you are fitting Rogue One in to a timeline that already exists mm -hmm. for th the viewers. Was there specific challenges with having to work that out? In many ways, you know, it's, it's funny. As, as fantastical as Star Wars is, we're treating it as a historical film, which means aesthetically we have to match some of that 1977's vibe. Before you know? there was great technology. Yeah, so y you have to make certain calls. Like, you can do things really slick and high-tech, but is that right? So the when you're dealing we... with, like, consoles where they're dealing on, on the ships and stuff like or, it, or it like to... they have a handheld computer and like everyone on the set has a handheld computer which is more powerful and more slick <laughs> than what these characters are carrying. 
But that's right, because that's the Star Wars equivalent. That's interesting. Now, we know a couple things about our listeners. Uh, they are nerds, <laughs> and they love trivia. So if you could appeal to our listeners, specifically my husband, can you give us a really beautifully nerdy nugget of Star Wars trivia? Well, do you know Vader's breathing where that sound comes from, right? Tell me. It's, it's, uh, it's the inside of a scuba mask. And uh, so just imagine Vader wearing scuba gear. And I don't know makes if that him, makes him more intimidating him, or less intimidating. I think less intimidating. <laughs> less intimidating. Um, is there a little nugget, like, from the new characters that are out there? Is there a little bit of nugget of... There trip? is, actually. Uh, if you take a look at Finn, the character played by John Boyega sure. in The Force Awakens, his old uh, stormtrooper number, FN 2187. Yeah. 2187 is also the number of the prison cell that Princess Leia was held in aboard the Death Star. What? And the reason why is that reference in and of itself, 2187, is a reference to a national film board film by Arthur Lipset called 2187. It was a very big influence on George Lucas, very interestingly edited short film out of Canada. So... As that's, you and I know, there's our Canadian roots there, just amazing. continuing forward. I, I feel like when my husband listens to this, after hearing that specific piece of trivia, he's going to close his eyes and just be silent and happy. <laughs> it will be like a deep meditation. I'm, I'm happy to offer <laughs> that. That's excellent. Now, Pablo, um, you are an expert in all things Star Wars, so obviously quizzing you about it would be futile. <laughs> so instead, we are going to test you on one of your other interests. Okay. Action figures. Okay. Yeah. Did you have a lot of action figures as a kid? I had a fair amount. Okay. Uh, but again, this is one of those things where I think limitations helped me because I didn't have as many. I had to basically work with what I had and come up with ridiculous stories from toys from different toy lines. And you, know. and you, and you put them together yeah, in odd Yeah, the original scenarios. mashups, right? Yeah. Very good. So I'm going to be reading marketing copy from an action figure that was for sale in the 80s or early 90s. And you just have to tell me what the action figure is. And if you need a hint, our puzzle guru, Art Chung, is standing by. Red one, standing by. Is that the right one? No, I was like, oh. Technically, uh -oh. technically, if your call sign is red one, you're red leader. Oh, red five, standing by. That's better. <laughs> it's a good thing I'm here. That's yeah, over right. that. <laughs> okay, are you ready? Yes. If you get enough right, Sarah Morrow from Hartford, Connecticut, is going to win an Ask Me Another Rubik's Cube. Wow. Okay. Pablo, we might have one for you, too. I'm just going to let you know. There might be one rolling around that you can have as well. Here we go. Here's your first one. The piratical adventurer with a heart of gold is 12 inches tall in this version. He has a fully detailed cloth uniform, laser rifle, movable arms, legs, and neck, and a Rebel Alliance honor medal. <laughs> That sounds like the 12-inch Han Solo. <laughs> that is the 12-inch Han Solo. Yes, a uh, replica not exactly to size, <laughs> but close. I like their marketing copy that used piratical. Piratical. Kids love that. They're, oh. they're drawn to, Mom, get me the most piratical yeah, toy. Right, exactly. <laughs> That's like a pirate that went to Yale. <laughs> Here's your next one. Accessories for this action figure include two nunchucks, for fast, furious, frenzied fighting, two ninja stars in case you missed the first throw, and pizza disc good enough to lick, but made to flick. That would be a Michelangelo oh. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. <laughs> yeah! We were concerned you didn't know which one of the four, but he's, obviously... He's the party dude. He's I, the party I, dude? I know he's the party dude. Right, yeah. right. You're doing great! Woo! Here's your next I, one. I, I just see that Rubik's Cube right now. <laughs> I know this. Eye in the prize. Yeah, Eye in the yeah, prize, yeah. yeah. Function, espionage. Due to his small size, he dares to go where others can't and won't. He's the most energy efficient and has the best vision of all of the Autobots. That would be Bumblebee. <laughs> yes! Bumblebee is my favorite Transformer. Why? Because he's small and helpful. See, do you see a trend here? You see there's a... Oh, R2-D2, Yeah, there's Bumblebee. a... I'm all for the little guy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess kids love... Energy efficient robots. <laughs> <laughs> big in the 80s. I, mean, I think Ralph Nader did Transformer commercials back in the day. No, he didn't. He didn't. That would be amazing. That'd be amazing, though. wouldn't it? Okay. Push button for a super tough uppercut punch on this character, cursed by the power to absorb the abilities, motives, and life forces of anyone she comes in contact with. That sounds like Rogue the X Men. That sounds correct. 
Do you think it's a little unfair that the female uh, X-Men's power is that she sucks the life <laughs> out of you? I think it may say something about the writer at the time. <laughs> <laughs> what they were going through. Possibly, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I try not to an analyze these things too much. Right. You're doing great. You're basically nailing this. We've got a couple more for you. Okay. This bad guy wears a helmet and a suit that costs as much as a jet fighter and can withstand a direct hit from a heavy machine gun and anything up to a three fifty seven Magnum. Whoa. Is that the armored Cobra Commander? It is the armored Cobra Commander, wow. my friend. It is. Now, you you know a little bit about G.I. Joe, I, I believe? Do. Yeah. Because you wrote a... I wrote a guide to G.I. Joe, yeah. So G.I. Joe, again, my childhood and anyone around my age is going to say the same thing. It's like their childhood was dominated by uh, G.I. Joe, Transformers, Star Wars, He-Man, like all this stuff. Yep. And, you know, we never put our, our, our childish things away. We <laughs> now, as a Canadian, were you fiercely aware that G.I. Joe was American? I was because, and this is, I, you got to love Canada for this, yeah. right? Hasbro Canada did their darndest, and they they took the toys and they got rid of the American flag stickers and they put Canadian flag they stickers did. on. They did, yeah. And occasionally they changed the uh, the tagline or the birthplaces. Like each figure would come with a file card, right? Yeah. So occasionally they changed the, uh, the birthplace of some of the G.I. Joes so they'd be Canadian, all right? <laughs> Thinking, I don't know what they were thinking. So they're they'd thinking, be like from Nanaimo, BC. Yeah. Or something so like they're that? thinking that that this will help uh, keep Canadian culture alive to all these kids who are playing with this stuff. But they neglected to remember that we're also watching the cartoon, which has a real American hero sung over That's and right. over again. <laughs> we're also getting the comic book, which tells us, you know, basically that the toys are living a lie. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you know, we appreciate so nice. it. Yeah. Uh, here is your last clue. The hungriest of all ghosts, no pizza or donut is safe when he's around. Is that Slimer? Yeah, yeah that go. is Slimer. The green ghost Slimer from the real Ghostbusters. No pizza or donut is safe when he's around. So keep him away from the Michelangelo figure or else you've got a lot of, a lot of tension right there. See, I, I can see this is what you did with your action exactly. figures. Exactly, You put see? them together you into find the new narrative. scenario. You find the narrative, yeah. Uh, you got them all right. I'm double checking that. Puzzle Guru Archung, how did Pablo do? He took everything we had at him and, and beat it to a pulp. <laughs> <laughs> and he and Sarah Munro uh, both won. Ask me another Rubik's Cubes. We, 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 we each won one. Yeah, we don't gonna, have to we, share one. Right? That's no. right. You okay, get good. your very oh, own. Good, good. Uh, that you you know that can interact with perhaps Bumblebee <laughs> or whatever Perfect. whatever the best friend will be. Pablo Hidalgo, thank you so much. Pablo Hidalgo is the creative executive at Lucasfilm, and the latest Star Wars film, Rogue One, comes out on December sixteenth. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Now it's time to crown our big winner. Let's bring back our finalist, Mary, who was an intern at America's Test Kitchen and ate a lot of beef tenderloin, and Owen, a park ranger who saved a possum. Puzzle Guru Archung, take it away. Thanks, Ophira. Mary and Owen, your final round is called Something Fishy. Every answer will contain a form of marine life. So, for example, if I said, it's a piece of sports footwear used in ice hockey, you'd answer, skate. We're playing this round like a penalty shootout. You'll each get up to eight questions. The contestant who scores the most points will be our big winner. And your prize is an Ask Me Another Rubik's Cube. We flipped a coin and Mary is going first. Remember, every answer contains a form of marine life. Here we go. Mary, a movie and MTV show that confronts people who pretend to be someone they're not on the internet. Catfish. Correct. Owen, Beatles song that opens with the line, I am he as you are he as you are me. I am the walrus. You got it. Mary. She's a celebrity chef who hosted 30-minute meals and who still has her own daytime talk show. Uh, Rachel Ray. Ray is the marine life, that's right. Owen, a 1986 film where Australian Paul Hogan said, now that's a knife. Uh, Crocodile Dundee. That's correct. Mary, the Metz Candy Company owns the brand name for this confection made with chocolate, caramel, and nuts. Oh, uh, Snickers? No, I'm sorry, we were looking for turtles. Oh. Oh, the yeah. Mets Turtles, yeah. Oh, I can't believe I missed a food question. <laughs> Owen, it's a verb that means to melt rock to extract the metal inside. Ooh. <gasps> An eel? No, I'm sorry. We're looking for smelt. Ah. Mary, who starred as the Gone Girl in the 2014 film Gone Girl? Oh, my goodness. What is her name? Um, Rose, Rosamund Pike? That's right. Well done. Owen. It's the only NFL team to ever have a perfect season with 17 wins, zero losses, and zero ties. Oh. The Seahawks? 
We're looking for the Miami Dolphins. Gotcha. At the halfway point, the score is now 3-2. to two. Mary's in the lead. Mary, it's a common lawn weed scientifically known as digitaria. Crabgrass? That's right. Owen, they're small, usually hexagonal wafers served with soups and chowders. Oyster crackers. That's right. Mary, it's a popular brand of heavy-duty smartphone and tablet cases. Um, Otterbox? That's right. Owen, it's a 2001 movie about computer hackers starring John Travolta and Halle Berry. Uh, swordfish. That's correct. Mary, it's a song by the band Heart where you burn, 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 burn to the wick. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I don't know. Rock lobster. <laughs> also a great guess. Now we're looking for barracuda. Oh, yeah. Owen, it's casino lingo for a gambler who bets lots of money. Oh, a shark. Oh, and that was close. A shark is a professional gambler who chases after bad players like fish, but a whale specifically is someone who bets a lot of money. Oh. All right, we're on to the last question. Mary's in the lead 5-4. to four. Mary, if you get this right, you win. A Batman villain once portrayed by Danny DeVito. The Penguin. That's right. Congratulations. You're our big winner. Yay! Congratulations, Mary. That's our show. Ask Me Another's Puzzle Guru is Art Chung. Hey, my name anagrams to Narc Thug. Our house musician is Jonathan Colton. Thou jolt a cannon. Our puzzles were written by Jonathan Bayless, Matt Foster, Danielle Thompson, and senior writer J. Keith Van Stratton. Ask Me Another's produced by Mike Katz of Travis Larchuk, Julia Melfi, Danny Shin, Ramel Wood, and our intern Camila Salazar, along with Steve Nelson and Anya Grunman. Ask Me Another was created by Eric Newsom and Jesse Baker. We'd like to thank our production partner, WNYC. And next week, we'll be back at the Bell House. I'm her ripe begonias. Ophira Eisenberg. And this was Ask Me Another from NPR. Now, I know if you made it to this point in the podcast, you are a fan of our show. Thank you so much. So, why don't you do us a favor and rate us on iTunes? Or better yet, leave us a review. Your support helps other people find our podcast. Thank you. Listening to the news all week is a duty and an obligation of citizenship. And also sometimes a real pain. Wait, wait, don't tell me. The NPR News Quiz is like Advil for the aching mind. Host Peter Sagal asks his panelists like Alonzo Bonin, PJ O'Rourke, and Paula Poundstone about the headlines and the bizarre stories found in the back pages. Wait, wait, don't tell me says the things on the radio that most people just shout at the radio. You can find Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me on the NPR One app and at npr.org slash podcasts. Next time on Ask Me Another, we're going to be dressed to the nines because our special guest is Project Runway's Tim Gunn. And maybe he'll help us figure out the difference between an empire waste and an empire strikes back waste. Also, do stormtroopers know that it is not cool to wear white after Labor Day? Join me, Ophira Eisenberg, for NPR's Hour of Puzzles, Word Games.